Hello again to everyone. So my name is Dorcas and uh, thanks again for those who have joined us and not in early. We shall start first uh, in view of time. Um, so this is 5 p.m. currently in Singapore. Thanks for those who are joining us also outside Singapore, especially also our speaker, one of them. So uh, as you have heard from the earlier publicity, so today's webinar is a webinar organized in conjunction with what is called Cyber Week. So Cyber Week is uh, an online conference on online dispute resolution that's held every year by the National Center of Technology and Dispute Resolution, which you can find online, odr.info. So this is an organization uh, based, based in the US, University of Massachusetts, but it has been a, quite a well-established organization featuring certain pioneers in the area of ODR many years ago and featuring even fellows or fellows of uh, that center, include Chitu uh, and myself and several other people. Right? So we're very happy today that uh, this particular webinar focuses on online dispute resolution and uh, with a, perhaps with a discussion on mediation. And we also want to share developments from Asia. Uh, so for to share that with us today, we have Chitu Nagarajan. We also have Rita Kato. So I'll just uh, introduce them in terms of uh, their background and then I'll pass the time to them. In terms of how this might this webinar might go, uh, we will have sharing from them. And then uh, we will have, feel free to, if you have questions or they are sharing to post them in the chat, Zoom chat, which I will see. Uh, then after both of their sharing, then I will moderate uh, some of these uh, questions or pick selected questions for our speakers to discuss. And also at some time, of course, if you want to join in the conversation. So that's how uh, this is going to start. Okay, so without further ado, uh, uh, I forgot to say that I myself, I'm from uh, Singapore Management University, as you can see the dome there, the Yong Bahao School of Law, where I do, some, I do quite a lot of research on dispute resolution, including mediation, negotiation, as well as online dispute resolution. So our first uh, speaker who's sharing with us today She's no stranger to the ODR field. She's uh, regarded as a pioneer and thought leader in field of ODR for more than 20 years. And uh, she's described as a serial ODR entrepreneur. And one of her latest uh, 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 ventures is finding co-founder of ODR.com. And uh, she's also known to be former co-founder of Modria, Crack ODR, eBay, and many, many more. Right. So uh, she's quite leading in the field of uh, ODR in India. So, and of course, as I mentioned, she's also a fellow of the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution. And our second speaker, uh, Rita Kato, she's, uh, she, she holds a lot of experience in the international field. She's trained as an English solicitor. Uh, and prior to joining WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization for short in 2020, she actually practiced an international law firm in London, and she has worked in Singapore and Geneva. So Rita is currently the representative of WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center, Singapore office, which some of us might be aware of when we see when we go to Maxwell. Uh, so let me hand the time now to Chitu, who will share with us about ODR from her perspective. Chitu, oh, I'll hand the floor to you. Thanks, doctors. Um, real pleasure to be here uh, today, um, and I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to just start off with uh, what is um, online uh, dispute resolution, and uh, then I would, you know, I know we are covering the Asian perspective, uh, but I really would like to touch upon what has happened in uh, India and uh, where we have uh, grown in the field of online dispute resolution. Um, and, um, you know, probably being the um, front runner now uh, in this field. So let me just start off with uh, the presentation. Um, now, what is, um, what is online dispute resolution? Um, this uh, definition um, has actually been taken uh, from one of the things which I'm going to present to you, which is the national policy uh, for online dispute resolution in India. And I love this uh, definition because it encompasses what ODR actually is. Now, online dispute resolution is the use of technology to prevent and resolve disputes. That's the crux of it. But however, 
just rudimentary integration of technology in the dispute resolution process does not qualify as ODR. ODR is also more than just ADR online, for it includes the resolution of disputes through AI ML tools and has no determined set of procedures. The term ODR is ever evolving and will continue to remodel itself based on new technological innovations. So this is actually the crux of online dispute resolution. So if you look at you know, what happened during the pandemic, a lot of us started using Zoom just to you know, communicate, uh, to do mediations online, to do arbitrations online, just to come in and appear. Does that really qualify as ODR? No. If you look at what we had done 20 years ago, uh, when we started off uh, with you know the eBay uh, example or what we did for eBay in the field of online dispute resolution, we had used a lot of technology in the dispute resolution process, right? Uh, to prevent, we used a lot of um, algorithms, automated stuff. That is what online dispute resolution um, is and actually was. And what we intended to do is, you know, give us a space to innovate in the field of dispute resolution and uh, transform the way the resolutions are uh, resolved. That's what we wanted technology to do, not just move mediation online or arbitration online. Uh, we just didn't want to do that. Just use a video conferencing tool or just use an, um, you know, email uh, to go back and forth. That was not the intention. So if you look at this definition, uh, definition, it encapsulates all of you know what I had mentioned. And the last part, ODR is, is ever evolving. So which means that now you know everybody's talking about AI, but later on it might be something else. And um, you know, when that happens, ODR will start including that as well. So that is the um, you know, first uh, thing which I wanted to mention uh, regarding what is online history presentation. Now, I had mentioned that uh, in India, uh, lots of things have happened, right? Um, I've been based out of India. Um, and um, if you look at it, all my you know, startups, I, I started some you know, 20 years ago um, in the field of online dispute resolution, a company 20 years ago. Um, but uh, were there any takers in India for that? No. Um, even the eBay experiments and all of that we did, uh, we did start using it for uh, eBay India. But um, if you look at the broader concepts of ODR, uh, it did not happen until uh, the pandemic happened. So uh, how did we create this environment in India where the government, uh, the business, the consumers, uh, everyone is talking about online dispute resolution? Uh, so first, there was an organization called Agami, and I have uh, Agami uh, just uh, sharing with you. I'm just going to go through some uh, sites so that um, you know you can get real hand information. Um, Agami is a nonprofit organization, uh, and uh, with a core, uh, um, you know, uh, idea of enabling a dispute resolution uh, ecosystem, um, and it it started creating an ecosystem for ODR where you know you could bring in the ministry uh the businesses the startups uh experts academicians everyone into this ecosystem and create an uh, ecosystem where all stakeholders are there and um, you know uh, everybody is involved in taking this to the next step uh so first first when uh, agami created that uh, ecosystem uh what they did is um they immediately, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, so what they did is immediately, um, they also had uh, something called the ODR handbook. So this is actually free. If any of you uh, want it, you can download it. Uh, so this is the first handbook in the world. And it create, you know, it actually gives you valuable insights and learnings too. Um, you know, how to successfully adopt ODR in your businesses. So this is what Agami did. You know, this is the first thing uh, which they did. Next, the most important thing which came about side by side is, this is called, 
designing the future of dispute resolution, the ODR policy plan for India. Uh, you know, it's 162 pages, but every single thing is covered in this handbook, uh, in this policy, right? It's a policy plan for India. And um, again, as I said, uh, this also happened during the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, if you go through this, uh, you'll be able to find out what you need to do at every single stage. And everyone currently, they are, uh, let's say that, you know, whether it's a consumer, I'm going to show you that next, or, um, you know, uh, mediators or, um, you know, the rural sector, uh, you know, so everyone can start um, adopting it. So you just have like, you know, getting ODR, uh, uh, getting India ready for ODR, right? And, um, you know, what is it that we need to follow the processes, the platforms? How does it work when it's code and X? How does it work when it's government run? Capacity building, mediators, arbitrators, um, everything is covered in here, including, including AI and automated uh, uh, resolutions is covered in uh, this uh, particular, um, you know, uh, policy. Um, Chitu, sorry to it, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to check whether you were uh, you meant to share something else with us. I think we're still seeing the first slide about the definition of ODR. Oh, so I'm that's, so sorry. that's to check. Oh, yeah. okay. I, I, oh, I'm so sorry. I was sharing something, and I'm so sorry. No problem. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Yeah, so our participants are very interested in the links that you actually yeah, just talked yeah. about. So, uh, mm. Are you seeing it right now? We see a document, yeah, yeah. designing so, the future of dispute resolution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, so I missed this. This was the first which I mentioned, the ODR um, handbook and Adami. Mm. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, enabling a dispute resolution ecosystem. It's Adami.in. The um, ODR handbook is downloading uh, the ODR handbook over here. This is what I had mentioned. The second thing is designing the future of dispute resolution, the ODR policy plan for India. Uh, this was what I was mentioning. And if you look at it, it's a 162-page book, uh, which covers everything. Um, and uh, you know, this is where I said, it's understanding ODR and its benefits, ODR in India, getting India ready for ODR and uh, suitably regulating ODR, right? Um, so everything is over here, uh, including, as I mentioned, um, artificial intelligence, as well as uh, you know, automated regulation. So um, this is the next. Uh, the third one, which um, also happened, and this happened just before the pandemic, it didn't even happen during, but it started happening before the hand, uh, pandemic, is you know, Reserve Bank of India. So if you look at Reserve Bank of India, this is the organization uh, which regulates all the financial institutions in India. What did they say? Um, they said that, um, you know, you must have online dispute resolution for digital payments. Um, this was a big, big, big initiative. And at the same time, what happened is, you know, we had in uh, India, a lot of payments also, you know, it's all, all through the phone, right? Uh, because it's through the phone, how do you resolve these disputes? Uh, um, you know, the transactions are happening via the phone. And if there are issues, that also should be done via online dispute resolution. So um, so this was something which uh, the Reserve Bank of India came up with. And um, following this, uh, what happened is, you know, this is something called sahamati.org.in and it's account aggregators. So in India, you have account aggregators where all the uh, financial um, you know, information providers, the financial information users and account aggregators are the non-banking financial companies um, you know, uh, who can actually play around with the data of people, right? And uh, um, all of this data uh, can be used uh, for financial transactions and uh, with the privacy, total privacy. So they also came up with online dispute resolution uh, mainly because of the Reserve Bank of India's uh, directive. And I would just like to show this piece over here where, you know, and since a lot of you are mediators, you know, I thought this would be really, really um, interesting. If you look at what happens is like, it goes through all of these processes, but, um, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, it goes to an ombudsman, 
Uh, and if they are not satisfied with an ombudsman, immediately what happens is it goes to an ODR institute. So I just mentioned that a lot of startups in India, uh, which a lot of, uh, you know, they all are online dispute resolution startups. And when I say online dispute resolution startups, it's really a bit different. Uh, it's really a bit different from even what I do. I do only ODR technology, right? I provide technology. Uh, but uh, in India, all of these startups are institutions where they provide technology plus they have uh, services, services meaning online mediation, online arbitration, they have mediators in panel, they have arbitrators in panel. So when it says, oh, yeah, that's the step which India has taken. So uh, when it says ODR institution selected by financial consumer, consumer can come and select an ODR institution. There are a lot of you know ODR institutions. And then they go through online mediation. If mediation is not successful, then they can go to online arbitration. So this is also something which has introduced online dispute resolution. Another big step which just happened this year is the securities uh, market, right, in India. Uh, it is called the uh, uh, SEBI, uh, which is uh, the Securities uh, Exchange Board of India. And uh, what they have said is uh, if there are any disputes in the market, they are, uh, and they've already done this, uh, establishing a common online dispute resolution portal uh, which will harness online conciliation and online arbitration for resolution of uh, disputes arising in the Indian securities market. So this uh, service uh, came up and um, immediately uh, they have also created this portal. And this is the portal. It's called Smart ODR, which is securities market approach for resolution through ODR portal. And uh, you have all of the ODR providers, you have, you know, the security people, you know, over here and the different players, right, over here and to resolve the disputes online. And, um, you know, very, uh, this is the, again, you know, when you click another page, it comes to this. Uh, so with this, what has happened, you know, I just would like to pause here a little bit. If you looked at it, I showed you payments. I'm showing you uh, securities. Um, and uh, so, you know, when you start investing, when you have a mutual fund uh, or you've done some payments, immediately you get um, an email or you can get a message or whatever saying, hey, if you have a dispute, you know, try online dispute resolution. So, you know, people also uh, everywhere, they're just like, you know, when you hear about it, they say, hey, they just ask me to go and log on to an ODR portal to, um, you know, file my uh, issue or file my uh, dispute. Um, over here too, you have uh, ODR institutions. And how they are doing it is if they have an issue, you go into uh, the flow, uh, similar to the previous one, and then you know you can go to um, online mediation and then online arbitration. Uh, the other thing, so these all have happened in the markets. We also have open networks. As I said, open networks is becoming very popular in India, uh, where we want to have interoperable uh, systems. And uh, here, uh, this is called the Open Network for Digital Commerce, ONDC. So in ONDC, what they have said is if there is, right, in cases where grievances escalates into dispute, they have online dispute resolution, which encomp encompasses three methods, conciliation, mediation, and arbitration, all online. Again, you have institutions, consumers can choose and you can go. So this is the first step. ONDC is taking it further where, you know, if you look at the way India is going is they are bringing in online mediation, online arbitration initially, but they're having all of these AI components which they are building up. They are also having automation which is being built up. So the second step would be more of, you know, introducing more automation into all of these flows. Um, now, uh, this is uh, another example where uh, the consumer, the Ministry of Consumer Affairs. So if you look at it, um, you know, a lot of issues happen every time, uh, whether in the e-commerce space or non-e-commerce uh, space. And over here, you know, an RFP has just gone out this week, uh, which says that they are also coming up with a platform uh, for, uh, you know, consumer disputes. And they're going to be putting that um, um, into place. And uh, I love this vision. Uh, solution that is the SS department to enhance consumer protection and ensure access to affordable, time-efficient grievance redressal mechanism that encourages settlements of disputes out of court through online dispute resolution. Uh, then uh, I think I, I wanted to, one more is over here. 
this is um, the um, in a small and medium enterprise uh, ministry. Um, and uh, they have a portal called Samadhan. Again, uh, Samadhan is entirely online for uh, disputes, um, you know, uh, related to the uh, small and medium uh, enterprises. So uh, this is where, uh, you know, online dispute resolution is going. And all of this has happened, as I mentioned, uh, you know, together in cohesion, uh, all from, you know, uh, the 2020, this is where it started. So in three years, uh, you can see, um, you know, how advanced uh, we are growing with a lot of companies uh, in the field of um, online dispute resolution. Uh, the last one which I wanted to mention before I stop is, um, you know, we just had an act uh, which came into place this year, which is uh, the Mediation Act, uh, the Indian Mediation Act, which is a huge step for uh, India, uh, where, uh, you know, there is legal recognition uh, for mediation and act is in place. It's really helping the cause. And um, over here, uh, they have, you know, uh, we insisted that online mediation should be mentioned because that is the future. And, uh, you know, Section 30 of the Act covers uh, online mediation. Uh, just to, you know, ensure that, um, uh, you know, we are covering this uh, because, you know, a lot of things are happening with online mediation, but the Act also will give a lot of uh, impetus uh, to what we're dealing with. So uh, basically, um, you know, uh, what I would like to uh, conclude with is, um, yes, uh, uh, a lot is happening in Asia. The last three years, India has been, I think, a forerunner um, in the world with where online dispute resolution is going. Lots of stuff happening. Uh, you can hear, you know, you can, you know, hear a lot of ODR companies coming up uh, every single month. It's growing. A um, lot of new innovation is coming up. Um, in the field of uh, ODR using technology uh, with the AI um, and, you know, how you can use data for different types of uh, uh, disputes, issues, uh, as well as automating stuff. So I think we're going to hear much more from here, but, you know, a great step for Asia as a whole. Thanks so much, Ritu. Really appreciate that uh, very, very comprehensive summary, but it's very encouraging to see, you say, since 2020, so many things have happened and then ODR is used in a wide spectrum of disputes ranging from consumer, e-commerce um, and uh, all kinds of business disputes as well. And that's encouraging, I suppose, because we also have heard that some ODR enthusiasts have lamented that the ODR platform, the one in EU, recently there was an announcement that it will be shut down. That's for consumer disputes, right? So uh, but it's encouraging to see, on the other hand, it's actually flourishing also for consumer disputes. Uh, so we look forward to uh, the chatting later in our conversation. I'll pass the time now to Rita. So for ODR in India, let's talk about intellectual property, which disputes which can transcend different countries. Over to you, Rita. Thank you. I just want to check that you can all see my screen. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, there's a bit of lag on my end, so apologies if... Um... I'm a bit delayed, uh, but hopefully everything's fine. So, um, so I'm the representative of the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center in Singapore. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, we are an ADR institution um, and we administer arbitration and mediation cases. Um, and uh, we also do online ADR as well. I'm so sorry, I seem to be having some technical difficulties. Are you, are you able to see the slides? Fine. Yeah, okay. It, yeah, okay. okay. We can hear you. We can see the slides. Very... I'll let you know if there's anything. Okay. I'm seeing something very odd on my end, but if, if you see everything fine, that's okay. Uh, so let me just move on to the next slide. Um, Um, so, yeah, so as I said, we, we facilitate the resolution of commercial disputes between parties, um, and that includes through ADR. We do have offices in Geneva and in Singapore, um, but there is no need for the parties to have any connection but, uh, with Geneva or Singapore to manage cases with us. And we do see a lot of cases obviously uh, get resolved online. So we've seen the cases, we've been managing cases online uh, for a very long time, pre-pandemic, uh, you know, pre-pandemic pre -pandemic as well. Although we have, of course, seen an increase since then. 
Um, we are a specialized ADR provider, so I think for the purposes of this of this talk, all I need to mention there is that we pre we uh, deal primarily with IP or technology related disputes. Um, so we have, um, I think, you know, about eighty to ninety percent of our cases uh, relate to IP or technology, but we do deal with some commercial disputes as well. But that's kind of where we're coming from. Um, and we have, of course, our, our ADR rules, which we update periodically. Um, so the last update was in 2021, and there were some relatively minor uh, amendments. But one of the amendments we made was to make it explicit that online um, dispute resolution was entirely permitted, and you can submit documents online, you can make notifications via email or via an electronic platform. There's no issue with that. That was, of course, possible under our rules beforehand, but we felt that it would be important to just flag the fact that it's um, that it's completely fine and there's there's no kind of procedural issues with that. Um, so I'm hoping you can see the caseload slide now. Um, this again, I won't go into much detail, but it's just to give you an idea of the kinds of cases we manage. As you can see, majority are um, IP or tech related, um, and the majority are also international in nature. And that's very relevant to um, online ADR because we have a lot of parties make use of online meetings and hearings uh, or other kind of preparatory um, uh, work online instead of in person. So the move online, there was obviously this like very sudden environmental change due to, due to the pandemic. So from 2020 to 2022, almost all of our um, cases moved online. So that includes arbitrations and mediations. So we had meetings and hearings take place virtually um, and we helped facilitate all of that. So at times lawyers were happy to sort of host things themselves, but other times they wanted us to host certain sensitive meetings or make sure that, that nothing was being recorded. So we kind of facilitated that. And it was a really good learning experience, I think, for all parties involved. As a result of that, we also actually published a online checklist, which I'll go through a little bit later, where we kind of used all of our experience that we had with managing online cases and sort of put together a document that can be of help to parties just to think about uh, what you need to do or what you need to prepare in advance of having a mediation um, or an arbitration. But I won't go into too much detail on that, uh, you know, mediation online. There was a notable increase in the, in the number of our cases. And, you know, I think it's difficult to really understand why that happened during that period. Uh, but it, we do think it may have been because of this move online where because everything was being done online, people were quite comfortable holding mediations online and therefore perhaps were more willing to mediate as a result of that. Um, in terms of what the trends, uh, what trends we see now, of course, in-person meetings are, are are possible again, but we do see, you know, use of online uh, or hybrid ADR um, continuing. So. I think everyone's a lot more comfortable. We certainly are, you know, we've always been comfortable. We, we obviously have more experience managing these types of cases online. Um, and I think it's just kind of everyone's comfort level has increased. And I, in terms of kind of general feedback, I have heard from some mediators or parties that they still prefer to have in-person uh, mediations, which is understandable. Of course, if it's a domestic dispute and, you know, you're all within about 30 minutes traveling distance, it makes, you know, why not have it in person? I, I completely understand that. Um, but I think for us, because we see so many international disputes, um, there is actually a real reason to have, uh, to be able to facilitate certain things uh, online. And even if it is a domestic dispute, sometimes domestic doesn't mean you're nearby. You know, I, we, I recently administered a mediation case with parties in the U.S., but they were um, in, in in two different states, very far apart from each other. So they were exploring the idea of having the mediation online. And that's what the mediator was encouraging because to avoid the travel costs, the kind of all the organizational costs and time associated with that. So I think it's just important to bear in mind, obviously it really mu very much depends on the jurisdiction and what you're dealing with, but um, we definitely you know, are still supporting it and encouraging that. In terms of our rules, I just wanted to include a slide, which I hope hopefully you can see, um, which just sets out all the different uh, um, parts of our rules, which facilitate electronic submission and you know demonstrate the flexibility that parties have with managing things online. But I, I don't need to go into much detail; it's just to sort of flag that. In turn, in terms of the kind of tools that we provide. Um, so one thing we provide is, of course, we can host meetings online, we can run tests with with um, with mediators and with parties, 
we usually recommend a test run. So, you know, prior to the mediation commencing online, we usually recommend sort of 30 minute meeting where we can walk everyone through all the different tools and the breakout rooms and we can prepare all of that. And we do all of that free of charge. So there isn't any kind of additional fee or anything for us to, for us facilitating that. Um, so we manage all of those things and we, uh, we try and have someone on standby as well during the mediation to make sure nothing goes wrong. But in our experience, it doesn't, nothing really ever goes wrong at this point. Everyone's quite comfortable um, but of course, you know, we do encourage very practical points like if you have if you don't have a connection, make sure you have access to a phone, these types of little practical things that I think are helpful for anyone who hasn't had a mediation online or any kind of legal hasn't had experience the legal process being conducted online. I think these things are quite important to sort of flag beforehand. What I hope you see on the slide is just a screenshot of our EADR tool. So this is a basically an online docket where everything can be submitted uh, so all the documents can be submitted securely uh, parties can post messages again this there's no additional charge to using this tool um, we haven't really seen it used very much in mediations because generally in our mediations there's not a lot of uh, document exchange or back and forth, generally speaking, you know, there's usually it's, you know, just to, to share a few documents via email is usually sufficient. But there are times when cases can actually become very complex. Um, our mediations usually kind of um, either settle or are terminated very relatively quickly after they commence, you know, within a few months. But we do have the odd case where, for example, the mediation is running concurrently with some litigation and it might then, you know, carry on for a very, very long time. So sometimes it is useful to have these tools. So uh, we do have this online docket, but I would say it's usually used for arbitrations um, and it's more appropriate for arbitrations. But that is kind of another example of the kinds of tools that you have um, at, at your disposal if you were to um, manage, a, sorry, to have a case administered by the WIPO Center. Um, this is just a screenshot and a link to our a uh, checklist for online conduct of, medi of uh, mediation proceedings. So it's just, again, a practical list and we try and update it when we can. Um, and it's, again, just something to think about both for the lawyers or if indeed if we have, have parties representing themselves, it's also something quite useful for them to have a look at. Um, in terms of the kind of case examples, um, one case example is, is online. So I wanted to flag this one because it was a, the, one of the benefits of holding this case online was that um, it was, you know, uh, parties from Europe and from Asia. So there was significant distance between them. So travel wasn't very um, easy to do. Um, and there were a number of preparatory conference calls and initial contacts of parties. So this can be quite helpful when you don't, you know, if you're if you're at a distance and you want to make sure that your one meeting, for example, is really uh, very uh, held very efficiently, is quite useful to have these types of preparatory calls. Um, but ultimately, in this case, there were actually three online mediation meetings. So rather than just having one, you know, sort of full day mediation, they sort of split it up um, and they also uh, realized that they needed another meeting. And again, this is something that we've seen happen with online mediations where, you know, I think you can sort of see it in a positive light or a negative light. I know some mediators like the idea that you're just in one room and you finish everything in one day. But equally, you sometimes, you know, it's good to have flexibility where you can actually organize a second online mediation or a third one. And it's much easier to arrange that online than if you were to try and get the same people uh, potentially at very senior levels to travel repeatedly for a mediation that can be quite I think prohibitive in terms of the process. So well, with this case there was three online mediations and then there was ultimately a settlement agreement um, within about three months uh, where they actually uh, found new ways of collaborating. So that was kind of just one quite positive example. Um, another a case or you know a numerous case examples that I wanted to share was uh, our work in um, Mexico and in Colombia in relation to um, copyright copyright cases, and that's kind of a bit of a unique scheme uh, because we work with the essentially the essentially the IP offices there for infringement proceedings. But what I wanted to highlight there was. Um, they had been running conciliation or what they call conciliation, but sort of mediation sometimes used interchangeably, but nonetheless, they were ha they were having these conciliation meetings for, you know, mediation proceedings for copyright disputes. And during the pandemic, I started working with them to facilitate the uh, having those meetings to be held online. And one of the really great 
outcomes from that was that um, these meetings are mandatory, so the parties do have to actually attend these things. So I think prior to the prior to them being moved online, something like 30 percent uh, of meetings were fully attended by both parties. But once we started providing online tools, sort of and being able to facilitate it online, that participation went up to 90 percent, which is obviously fantastic. And I think it's again demonstrates that sometimes people genuinely don't attend mediations because it's just not possible for them to travel, especially if it's in a country with very, very large distances, if it's smaller disputes where perhaps, you know, the, the cost of traveling somewhere just doesn't make sense. Um, I think it just demonstrates how actually important it can be to have these other options available. Um, I think that's kind of where I want to end it because I'd like to keep some things to discuss for the for the Q&A. But if there's any other further information that people want about our work, um, we have a page, we have a contact email address, Arbiter Mail at WIPO, um, where we answer any kind of general queries. Uh, so feel free to contact us there. And uh, that, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rita. So yeah, thanks so much for sharing the details, including your you have your own system where things can be documents can be exchanged securely, and also it seems like you play a very active role in preparing parties, even you administer even mediations. It's yeah. interesting thing that uh, you mentioned is also attendance has really increased once that was uh, allowed, especially even within the same country like US. Sometimes traveling the uh, distance might be really an inconvenience. Another thing you highlighted was also one example you gave that you said there are three online sessions, right? Just okay. curious, was it a full day session or those three online uh, mediations? I don't think they were full day sessions, but they were they weren't sort of one hour sessions. They were kind of substantive kind of meetings. It, I mean, I know sometimes there are mediation sessions which are very brief and when they're held online, uh, but generally what we've seen is that they are nonetheless still quite long. What we've also, in terms of the feedback we've received from mediators uh, when they've managed quite long mediation sessions online is that they've just essentially um, kind of used a practical approach where when it's a very long mediation, they will sometimes uh, agree in advance that there will be certain breaks so people don't get fatigued from the screen. Um, it's it's kind of, we've, we've received different types of feedback. Some mediators really like the idea of having kind of a very set break make sure it's very you know very simple for parties to take a break constantly other mediators think that's actually not necessary um but i think you know i think it just demonstrates that with each case you kind of have to take a um a tailored approach to that yeah exactly the tailored approach yeah so this is uh we're having a conversation now so i did say in the if you're free to post anything you want in the chat if not, you can also raise your hand and also ask a specific question. And, and just to summarize where we are at, we have heard from Chitu as well as Rita in terms of the latest developments in online dispute resolution in their context. So we have seen in terms of cross-border disputes, commercial disputes, as well as within India, how it has been harnessed in various kinds of disputes. Um, and also what uh, Chitu highlighted, if we just recall how she started off, the definition of ODR, in a sense, and that was really helpful in the sense that you, you're saying that it's not just online ADR, reminding us also how it started when you have a system like in PayPal, where it was not just online ADR, but it's actually designed such that technology somehow changes the design of dispute resolution. And you also highlight that, that it might change in the future as we see different kinds of technology. So yeah, so feel free, anyone want to post any questions. But I, just to set, uh, uh, start us off, perhaps I could pose a very general question to both of you, Rita and Chitu. Um, in terms of, based on the trends that you have seen and also some of the things you have shared with us, how do you think uh, mediators, um, perhaps what role do you think mediators can play uh, to be part of these developments as uh, ODL evolves and also changes the mediation process? Uh, any thoughts, Chitu, first? Yeah, um, I think mediators play a very important role, uh, mainly because um, they are going to be, um, well, let's say, you know, you're doing two things over here, right? One is, um, you know, we always talk about, when we talk about online dispute resolution, we talk about dispute design. When you talk about dispute design, it's very important for us to understand uh, what are the facts of the disputes, what is it that we need to take care of. So the, the more and more feedback mediators give into a system, uh, we can develop better technology. 
The same thing for AI as well, uh, because AI is going to help us. So the more and more you know, mediators also start feeding and training those AIs, uh, we are going to get better outcomes, right? Um, so they play a major role over there. Uh, the second thing is, um, you know, when you are conducting online uh, mediation, um, again, uh, you want your platforms to be better, right? I spoke about AI, I spoke about investment, but, you know, when you want your platforms to be better, what is it that matters to you most? What is it that matters in a mediation? What is that which matters to a party? So um, they are very, very core to the problem uh, or to a solution, right, of what they're coming up to. For me, myself, I think I, um, you know, I can speak because I am a mediator and to look at all the uh, systems I um, have developed, it always comes from my thinking as a mediator. Okay, what would I do? Or what is it that the parties would think of? Or can we do this better? So I think um, they do play a major role and they can play a major role. Thanks, Chitu. So, so have you been, uh, have you been seeing that in India that the the mediators are giving feedback with those who are startups or ODR and then they're working together? Yes, yes, a, mm. a lot, a lot of feedback, a lot of feedback. And if you look at the um the ODR institutions which are coming up, of course, a lot of them are from, uh, you know, lawyers and all of that, but they all get trained in mediation. Um, and you know, because they get trained in mediation, they are able to understand it. But even if you're developing, you know, for arbitration, it's good for us to know the concepts, right? And mm. when they are institutions like this, uh, they do get feedback, and feedback is what is going to help us improve the systems. Mm. Thanks, uh, Rita. Any thoughts you want to share with us? Um, I think, I mean, I think Chitu covered most of most of them, really. I would just say that I think it's always a learning process with how you use online ADR. And I think in terms of what mediators can do, I think it's just keep an open mind and suggest on, online um, meetings to the parties. Because I think sometimes, you know, obviously when you're a mediator or you're, you know, familiar with mediations, this might seem like an obvious thing. Like, of course, it's an option. And if the parties didn't raise it, then perhaps it's because they don't want it. But I think it is important sometimes to actually raise the idea with parties if they want to have some prep meetings or conduct the entire thing online um, because sometimes parties are just not you know don't really think of that so I think it's just being open-minded and uh, being flexible in how you utilize it for a particular case and equally not push it if, if it's actually not really um, wouldn't suit that dispute. Mm. Yeah so again the idea of the customizing the, the, the needs of the parties so I think one question that seems uh, has been asked by a few uh, by both uh, Lance as well as Linda um, so looking more projecting towards the future, we have talked a lot about how Zoom has already propelled uh, uh, more widespread use of mediation in online video conferencing. Right? So one of the questions here is that could we shed some light on what is being done to train AI? Uh, is it more from data science or generative AI? So I suppose it's referring to AI that is in part and parcel of ODR systems. And in related vein, Lance has asked, could you give some ex specific examples of AI use that have assisted in mediation? Would any of you have uh, insights to share uh, on these two related questions? I can take that up first. Mm. Um, so uh, with AI, you know, we all know AI is a buzzword. Uh, and I think everyone uses now, you know, chat GPT, right? Uh, and yeah. everybody wants to use chat with you. So, um, you know, I know for uh, many of the mediators and what we are also hearing, what we're seeing, what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, in mediation itself, uh, it's being used for, you know, reframing. Uh, it's being used for generating options. It's mm. being used, uh, you know, to... Uh, uh, so many of the things which we uh, do in mediation, if we just put it onto uh, chat GPT uh, to say, okay, you know, how do you reframe this? Or how do you generate this option? This is the situation. What is the best alternative? Uh, it gives you certain, um, you know, certain prompts. Right? In the prompts you give, and it gives you answers. And what you do immediately is you can think about it whether yes, you know, is that the right thing? Can I use it for my case? And then you put it over there. So that's where I see that um, you know it is being used for mediation. But um, on a training AI. Um, is it, uh, so, you know, we do need uh, data science. We are exploring that as well. And if you look at it, many people are exploring it right now, where, you know, how can we actually analyze this data and uh, give some predictions, right? Mm. Um, so that is being um, done, a lot of experiments and a lot of research R&D is being done on that. 
And uh, when you say it's a uh, generative AI, it's more of the prompts which you know we are doing, right? And um, these prompts can help in so many things. It can even help in selection of mediators, um, you know, for a particular case. So we are breaking down AI into different things in the mediation process itself. It can be pre, it can be post. And, um, you know, um, we are going to see many, many more uh, companies doing this, many more outcomes. And I think um, at one given, now it's quite easy for us to find out, okay, who are the OER companies, who's doing this, who's doing that. But, um, you know, in the future, it's going to be like, there's going to be like so many things present. It's going to be quite difficult for us to actually find out, you know, what's happening here, what's happening there. Yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, a lot of things are happening in each and every place. And I feel that every ODR company or every technology company in the dispute resolution space is going to have some sort of AI in some part of their, you know, dispute resolution process. Yeah. Uh, just, just to... Uh, just to follow up on what you shared. So, but so far, have you seen any of these AI being incorporated into their dispute resolution processes by ODR companies? Some kind of assistance uh, for parties or for uh, mediators? Yeah, so, um, you know, you do have Nefleros, uh, they are using AI. And, um, Sorry, which one? Kleros? Kleros, yeah, Kleros, yeah. Yes, yes, they are yeah. using AI. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you do have that. You do pay, uh, you have not an AI. Uh, that also has that. So you are having, you know, a lot of those companies also coming up uh, where, you know, you are finding this, um, you know, AI models over there. Yeah. Rita, is, is this something that you are looking into also? How it could be incorporated in my post ADR process? Um, I think, you know, obviously we always track any sort of trends and legal trends and technological trends where they're, where they're relevant. I think... In terms of AI, we haven't really seen it used so far in mediations. Um, I'm not, it hasn't really been raised as a point. I saw there was a there's a question in the chat actually about the case example and whether there was um yeah. any plans yeah. to start using or using AI interpretation as part of the online dispute process. Yeah. I think I think I mean personally, just my own personal view is I think perhaps AI is not quite there yet in terms of really playing a huge role in mediations, you know, sort of this year or maybe next year. But I think in the future there's there may be a role. Um, for us in terms of the human interpreter, I think it was a human interpreter, I should say. And in terms of using AI interpretation in the future, I think at the moment the way that we manage language is by um, using mediators who have different, you know, multiple language mm. skills. We, we often see cases where, for example, a mediator is appointed who can speak English and can speak Chinese and then can conduct the mediation appropriately. Um, but I think it's just something at the moment is still very much early days, um, but it's something that we'll obviously, you know, pay attention to, to and see how it develops. Yeah, interesting about, uh, because it's used a lot in Zoom, right? Sometimes sometimes the, the, the online translation. So your personal view is it's not, it's not that great. That, that right. AI, the AI translator, does it work very well or there um, be quite I a lot of problems? I haven't personally seen it used in cases. Mm. Um, I think the... I think with mediation, you know, a lot of it is just about, obviously, as everyone knows, it's about kind of discussions and kind of the really having a lot of the skills that perhaps, I don't know, I have, I think, any, it's difficult for me to have an opinion because I just haven't really seen it been used so far. So I mm. think it's kind of hard for me to say whether I think it's good or not um, and whether the quality of it is good at the moment, because I think for so far we've been able to handle things without using that. But I guess in the future, there may be scope for it. Sure. Yeah, so so on, on this this question in terms of AI, I, I guess uh, besides what you do mention, Claros, uh, there was some discussion also in Cyber Week and uh, some earlier webinars. Uh, so I guess Chitu is saying how people are trying to incorporate Chat GPT, just using it in mediation to reframe to summarize. Uh, I think it was mentioned also one conversation between Daniel Rainey and uh, Colin Rue. They say sometimes. If there's a dispute as to you know whether your view is correct or my view is correct, then they might pose it, pose it to the chat GPT and then see whether what, what, what they feel. I mean, it's, it's like an almost like an impartial kind of party. So and also brainstorming of options. Uh, in terms of uh, the LOM probably being used, I, I think I'm I'm aware that it's being used. There are a lot of chatbots now that uh, companies are using to help them negotiate deals or to actually incorporate it in their own websites so that they can those websites can negotiate with consumers in terms of bargaining prices. 
So things like nibble and uh, pack them, I think is used by Walmart you know, to help them in their negotiation. So there's a comment by Julian. I guess if AI is being used, there's a question of confidential info being discussed, being fed or processed by the AI system. Yep, so uh, I mean, any comments on that? I know, I know, of course, now there are some concerns. There's therefore, like banks or other uh, institutions, sometimes they are wary of using GPT unless it's something that's really it did not control in terms of data. Any comments yeah. on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's right, right? Because there is, uh, uh, I think uh, what we do these days is, uh, and everybody's using chat GPT, you're putting everything online. So one of the things is like, let's say that, um, you know, uh, the case itself, um, you know, let's say receiving case data or documents, I'm just talking about it from a legal standpoint. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, is the, what is it going to do? It's going to store that and, uh, you know, it's a breach, right? You cannot do that. You cannot like actually put in confidential information. So we need to be really careful about that. Um, and that's why, you know, it's better um, when we build these systems, we always think about this, you know, we do have this, but how do we, utilize this model and uh, put it into our own system so that we can come up with AI models which are secure rather than public. Um, I think that's mm. something which, uh, you know, when we develop systems or when, uh, you know, people are thinking about uh, using the systems, that's something which, you know, you need to take care of. Yeah, thanks so much for pointing that out because, I mean, I think that's an excellent juncture to also point out that, uh, you know, there are standards that have been developed Right, so so this is uh, the, the link I put in the chat. This this one has been developed actually by the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, or they actually have a related organization called iCoder when they have developed standards which they suggest that ODR systems should adhere to. So things like uh, confidentiality, uh, equality, fair and partial, and of course equality, there's all these issues about preventing bias. And I think similar standards also have been introduced. I think some of us are aware, right, by, by APAC, um, that, that they also consulted with uh, iCoder to, to arrive at their own standards, which I think providers should uh, actually provide. And there's a comment by uh, Lily that chat GLT 4.5 is by subscription. Confidentiality is supposed to be secured and not shared. However, this is yet to be tested. I suppose I, I, I can't comment. I don't know whether anyone knows. Is it my really apology. secured? My Sorry? apology. My apology is supposed to be Chat GPT version four point five. Uh, That's yeah. the subscribe version. Uh, the enterprise part I understand is subscribed by the MNC or the company, the big company itself. So uh -huh. it seems that they give a surety that the data that you use in the Chat GPT for is relevant to you, kept, yeah. and then will not be shared to the world at large, like. 3.5, yeah, a version, yeah. free version. The free However, version. However, I have asked before, what if I, three years down the road, stop subscribing? What Question. happened now with my data? Everyone goes quiet. No one can ah. answer that part. So it, it, it's a little bit worried, but then the key, the chat GPT 4.5 is really that useful. They have a plug-in version where you use extra toolkits, everything. And the fact that you have mentioned about uh, meetings, interactive online, real time, as you speak in English, there it will be another version in Bengali, in Tamil, in Mandarin, real time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that clear and really good, supposedly. But what I have seen is a pass on, uh, uh, already happened, and then you convert it into Spanish whatever language that you want. Right, right. Not the simultaneous translation, but what, not the what, simultaneous like pass, one. Like pass communication. Right. You, mm. I, I, I go across that about three weeks ago, attend a engineering related conference. They mm -hmm. simultaneously uh, convert it from English live to mm -hmm. Vietnamese and Mandarin and French, I believe. And they ask at the end of the day the survey, how do you find that that copy? that version is it good but i was too engrossed into the actual version i did not try them out ah so you wouldn't know the survey results as to overall i don't know it, but... about the precision <laughs> yeah right it's, it's a real real time from uh, uh convert into the relevant languages 
Thanks so much for sharing, Lily, uh, both in Thank terms you. of uh, there's an issue about assurance of continual mm. confidentiality, even after you stop using it. There's always this that issue that uh, a lot of companies have to consider, right? And uh, assurance yes. of confidentiality. And also simultaneous translation and where, where this would develop in the future. We have time for perhaps one more question before we might try to round up. Would anyone like to add on, uh, add on to the conversation comments also are welcome. If not, I would probably want to ask. I actually, actually, I, I just heard uh, this comment, okay, Chitu and uh, Rita, because personally, personally, I'm actually quite curious also as to not just technology, uh, and how it interfaces with mediation, but also how that technology interfaces with humans, how we behave, our psychology, our brains, as well as our how we work. And interestingly, I am um. I'm actually looking at how uh, people negotiate differently across different modes of communication. So we're not incorporating AI, we're just using things like Zoom, uh, using things like WhatsApp, text messaging. And then, uh, yeah, so getting people and several people to do negotiations across these modes. Um, and so I'm so curious in terms of some of the things that you might, maybe anything you might observe in terms of mediators for, for example, Rita mentioned some of them find it difficult to concentrate for the entire day. They need frequent breaks. Um, I'm about to summarize some of the interdisciplinary research in, a, in an article to come out next year that, that also summarizes, for example, Zoom compared to mediation. There's some suggestion by scientific research that your creativity goes down. And in fact, today I just found one article in my research associate. I think he found it from Yale, uh, psychiatric uh, uh, article. and looking at brain waves, we seem to suggest that the in-person interaction compared to Zoom interaction, the brain activity is actually decreased. You use your brain in colloquial terms, you use your brain a bit less when you're using Zoom compared to when you had that face-to-face -face interaction. So I'm just wondering anecdotally whether you're, you have any thoughts as to how mediators you know, can adjust, not just to Zoom, but also any other new technology that changes the way people interact. Um, I mean, I can, I mean, I know one an anecdotal kind of thing I can share is I know one mediator told me that uh, doing Zoom was quite good because actually you could really see everyone's facial expressions much clearer and you can kind of look at everyone <laughs> to your leisure because obviously it's not, uh, you know, you're not people you can't see who you're looking at or who you're, you know, focusing on more. And so that can be quite interesting and especially because everyone is potentially so close up and it can actually really facilitate um, gauging how everyone is feeling. So I thought that was an interesting comment to make. I think ultimately um, it's just a matter of adjusting to a new situation. I think online ADR will be sort of here to stay. I know that um, I, I saw there was a question in the chat about whether certain disputes are more suited to OD ODR than others. Mm. I think... Um, I think aside from obviously, any, I think it just, again, depends on the case, but I would say that I think particularly um, perhaps disputes with, where the cost of having an in-person mediation is actually quite high relative to the cost or the value of the dispute is where it really makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. and especially where travel might be difficult, maybe not even just financially, but just from a logistical point of view. And I think the key point about um, online dispute resolution is not simply that you're just taking the same cases and you're just passing them on and putting them online. Mm. I think the idea should be more about actually having more mediations, having cases that perhaps never would have mediated and having them being held online as opposed to not at all because of these kinds of um, natural uh, roadblocks, let's say. So I think that's something that um, you know you can think about. Mm. Any thoughts, Chitu? <laughs> On, on this topic yeah i i um yeah you know for me i i just feel that um it's just not mediation right uh most of the business meetings are happening online um a lot of interactions are happening online right now the younger generation only communicate online they do not know how to communicate offline um so uh, we are living in, in you know that era um, and, uh, you know, technology is going to do many things to us, um, but we have become victims um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be that way. Uh, so I, I really don't think that it's going to affect uh, you know, the mediation process as such, because this is how 
uh, we are living in. And uh, so I think, um, yeah, <laughs> this is just going to be an interesting. How do you adapt to it, adopt to it? Younger generation, as I said, will adapt to it very quickly. I think uh, uh, for the other generation, because of the pandemic, they started getting used to it as well. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't mm. think it's going to have an impact. Mm. Yeah. So I think just one final comment uh, in terms of someone has just heard that uh, I think Carl just pointed out. Uh, if you have any tips and anyone else in the the room as well, how do you enforce certain ground rules? As for example, some people refuse to turn on their camera or not leaving the room, having camera on and not leaving the room and no one else is there. Um, I also like to highlight what Linda has, has shared that she appreciates uh, your insights and her company, ResoX, is currently training AI as a dispute resolution, a, a dispute advisor in four different roles. So that's just Sula, Chitu, and Rita. No. But anyone like uh, both Chitu, Rita, want to talk about misconduct or, or undesirable behavior, which, which mediators have been able to somehow control? Any tips to share? Yeah, I mean, I can share. I know I've had um, a few cases, I think, where the mediator did establish, um, what, sorry, one a mediate, mediation, also an arbitration, because arbitration is obviously a more procedurally um, formal than mediations are. Mm. Um, but in that case, essentially, you just have to get the part. I mean, ultimately, it's one of those situations, someone doesn't want to call prayer mediate, that's kind of, you can't force anyone to do that. But I think if people are coming to mediate, they do want to participate there, they don't generally have an interest in just not cooperating at all. But in mm. order to just make sure everyone's on the same page and avoid uh, problems during the process, what the mediators um, have done is sort of set out the rules in advance, so everyone has to have their camera on, Maybe even given guidance about where the camera should be, so it shouldn't be sort of like on the side where only side half your face is viewed, or you know, uh, or like below where you can't really see what you're saying. You know, there can be quite um, let not say uh, quite detailed, let's say instructions about where you should place your camera, making sure you have backup devices, uh, making mm. sure if anyone ever enters the room or exits the room that is notified, mm. and part essentially having the parties agree to that in advance. Where that's done more formally in the form of actually having to sign some sort of agreement to that is an arbitrations but that's quite a okay. different procedure but i think that you know it can be used in mediations right. um and that, i mean we haven't seen uncooperative parties to be honest with you like in our mediations people are there because they want to settle they're not sort of there just to sort of waste time so we haven't luckily i guess haven't had that issue but i think that's there are good. ways of doing it that's good i think it might probably be an issue more like mandatory mediation <laughs> some people just have to be there yeah. whereas if they are committed then unlikely happen any final thoughts you do before we, we close um no i, I think we can you know summarize that <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much um yeah so i would just like to share these two links uh in closing so one is uh the the link to the, the two institutions that are collaborating to present this webinar so do check out odr.info because there are some other meetings that are going on it's still thursday so there's one more day friday and there are also recorded sessions on this topic so it, we will have we have people all over the world who are chatting on this and then the other the other one is uh, society of mediation professionals uh, which is um, also uh, where um, Julian and I, uh, Julian has invite, kindly invited Rita, so Julian to our post. So we, uh, Julian and I are part of the Society of Mediation Professionals, Exco, where we would like to have more mediators, both in Singapore, around the world, um, meet together and also discuss things that are common to us and build uh, a safe space for us where we can feel like we can be a profession. So on that note, could we just virtually or, or, or with uh, actions uh, express our uh, uh, gratitude to our appreciation for Rita and Chitu. Thanks so much for taking the time to share a lot of available insights and all the resources to us. I'll check with you later as to whether you're comfortable sharing some of the slides. I think some of them have requested, but I'll check with you on that. It's, it's so, fine for me. Yeah, it's fine. And thank you very much for everyone for listening and for the for the questions. Yeah, thank, thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Have a very good evening, or if you're somewhere else in the world, morning or afternoon. Take yeah. care. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. bye. Bye. Bye.